We human beings have taken over the whole planet, but now we must learn to share it or else we will lose it. We have to outgrow tribalism, patriarchy, all our old ways, and we have to move fast because we're running out of time. Oaxaca state in the south of Mexico, where life hasn't changed much for centuries, until recently. This little show is part of the Miss Universe pageant, a bevy of international beauties who've taken over the town square to the amusement of curious locals. Some have been dressed up in native costume to add local color to the show. Though not many Mexicans really dress like this anymore, unless they're being paid for it by an American TV crew that needs to show the world the usual stereotype of Mexico. Now everybody will be behind my camera, please. My camera's right behind you. I would like to roll, so get out of the way. Germany! I need Miss Germany, please. Thank you. And Netherlands? Here. Oh, of course you are. <laughs> we don't need Cyprus at this moment. We need Spain over here, please. And Germany. Everybody up now. Muy felice. Music and action. Go there. Thirty years ago, a Canadian media analyst called Marshall McLuhan came up with the notion of the global village. And here we are. An American film crew shooting a bunch of would-be beauty queens from all around the world in a southern Mexican town. And the whole thing will be broadcast to the entire planet. Global village television. And yet, their cameras over there and our camera right here and all the television sets at the other end are transforming the world doesn't even matter what they put on the screen, really. The point is that we can see everybody else in the world now, and they can all see us. That's changing the way we think about each other, how we behave, even our chances for sharing this overcrowded planet. Essentially, it's turning us all back into villagers. And in some very serious ways, villages are different from cities, which is just as well, because our cities are dying. Son las 6 con 48, las 6 con 48 minutos, monitor de la mañana. Bueno, vamos ahora con otros asuntos. El químico Guerra está a bordo de nuestro helicóptero. Ingeniero Guerra, buenos días. Hola, doctor, buenos días. El día de hoy está amaneciendo sumamente contaminado. No hay viento, no hay nubosidad y por lo tanto es muy probable que el día de hoy tengamos altos índices de ozono. Mi reporte es que no es conveniente correr, no es conveniente hacer ejercicio intenso en el exterior se corre de riesgo a la salud. Prácticamente no hay viento y sin embargo... Luis Manuel Guerra is a flying ecologist on Mexico City's most popular radio station. Guerra is a chemist and environmental crusader who spends his life battling Mexico's pollution. And it's a full-time job. Sí. 
This is the world's most polluted city. Ozone pollution should not break 100 more than one day a year. Mexico City breaks that level almost every day. Some days it's close to 400. School children here should not run at recess because breathing deeply damages their lungs. And it's claimed that the city's lead levels depress children's IQs by seven points. Some of the lead comes from factories, but most comes from the city's cars. There are three million cars in Mexico City now. That will double by the year 2000, emitting more lead and more carbon dioxide. The global village is not just linked by television images. It's linked by an ecosystem that's being pushed to the limit. With dozens of third world countries industrializing at a headlong pace, Mexico City is a glimpse of what the future may look like. And it scares environmentalists like Luis Manuel Guerra. We are on the brink of a catastrophe. Mexico City uh, shares some of the most important air pollution and water pollution problems in the world. And if this city doesn't change course in the next few years, it's not going to be uh, livable anymore. Imagine a whole generation, and we are talking about 10 million children in this city, that is growing up with a um, sense that they are living in a city that harms your health, that, that they are trapped in a bubble of uh, noxious gases. And that, is, of course, is going to have psychological and cultural and educational repercussions in the near future. In the past decade, the city's population has doubled to 18 million people. Bigger than New York, bigger than Tokyo. Our planet changed profoundly when countries like the United States and Japan industrialized, but now practically the whole world's doing it. An immense migration is pouring into the cities from the rural areas, all seeking the good life they see on TV. The first generation in the cities does whatever it can to survive. Half a million street hawkers in Mexico City sell everything from cotton candy and chiclets to electric can openers. Some people on the outskirts of Mexico City live in garbage dumps, where they earn a living by scavenging the enormous waste generated by the city. But many of them will eventually move on to better jobs, or at least their kids will. Human beings have been down this path before. We've just never done it on this scale before. There will be five cities in the world as big as this one by the end of the decade, and dozens more with over 10 million people each. Throughout the third world, their waste is polluting waterways and poisoning forests, farmland, and anything else that gets in the way. Mexico City's problems are not unique. Uh, they are a microcosm of what happened everywhere in the world if you disregard 
the protection of uh, nature in favor of a rapid growth. If we develop more harmoniously, we can stop uh, cities to become like Manila, Mexico City, Jakarta, Cairo, and so on, that are an example on how not to plan and just grow. Ten years ago, Guerra was head chemist at Merck Sharp Pharmaceuticals in Mexico, but he gave up his job and his salary to take on his country's growing pollution crisis. He started the Autonomous Ecological Institute, now Mexico City's best-known environmental watchdog. It takes independent daily pollution readings, partly to keep the government honest, and partly to spread awareness to a nation just learning the dangers of pollution. Guerra knows the dangers well. Some years ago, he discovered that his own daughter had dangerously high lead levels in her brain. To protect her, his family fled to the outskirts of the city. They built themselves a small refuge that seems almost surreal in the context of Mexico City. A self-sustaining house run entirely on rainwater, wind and solar power. The backyard looks like Noah's Ark. Guerra chooses to live like this to set an example. But eventually, he believes, we will all have to live like this. Uh, you have to be very um, rational with the use of energy, for example. You cannot have a television set on, all the lights in the house on, and at the same time using the blender. Uh, the system won't allow for that. So you have to be aware that uh, if you use the blender, you cannot watch at the same time television. And then you get a vision on how the future will be. Guerra advises everyone from IBM to Mexican government officials on pollution control. Today, he's with Aeromexico executives, translating a video on airline pollution from the original German. Mexico's government is finally tackling the country's environmental crisis, but the desperate need for jobs means the authorities can't be too strict. They've made catalytic converters mandatory in buses and a fleet of green Volkswagen eco-cabs, but private car drivers don't have to switch over until they buy a new car. The transition will take another 15 years. The city has even passed a law requiring each car to be registered and kept off the road one day a week. But many people just buy a second car for that day, usually an old one that pollutes even more. Everybody seems to have a few hundred dollars for today's car and big ideas for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really blame the Mexicans. The mentality here reminds you of North America in the 1950s, when chrome-plated cars were the keys to the good life. And the good life did arrive after a fashion. About one-fifth of the world's people now have their own cars, TVs, fridges, and microwaves. And collectively, these billion first-world people account for four-fifths of the consumption in the world. But now the rest of the human race is chasing the same goals, and a lot of them are going to make it, which poses some serious problems if you do a little arithmetic. Only one Mexican in eight owns a car today, and countries like Brazil and Russia and Korea fall in about the same range. Not one Chinese in a hundred owns a car yet, and the same is true for India and Indonesia. But in 20 or 30 years, we could be seeing first world rates of car ownership. That's a car for every couple of people in most of the big third world countries. Not just cars either, but the whole range of industrial consumer goods.